Hey everyone, my name is Max, I'm from the NEO protocol and uh, this is the part of our whiteboard series. Today here with me is Pierre from Parity. He's working on Leap P2P and uh, Pierre, do you want to introduce Leap P2P to everyone? Uh, yep, so Leap P2P is several things. Initially the history of Leap P2P is it was the networking stack of IPFS made by Protocol Labs. So Protocol Labs started IPFS, okay. um, released IPFS, and they were like, oh, it would be nice to uh, make this networking stack available to other people. So we just extracted the P2P from that. Uh, and what it is exactly, it's kind of a protocol, kind of a framework, it's kind of intertwined. Like when designing the P2P, it's, they are kind of designing the protocols, but at the same time, how you're supposed to use it. At least for the Go and JavaScript version, the Rust version is a bit on the side. We are doing things a bit more on our own. Uh, what, really what, what do you mean, like on, a, on, on your own? Uh, like we haven't followed the API of JavaScript and Go. Oh, I basically. see. Yeah. And initially it was Go, right? Or JavaScript? Uh, so IPFS was originally Go. So they extracted it in Go, more or less, but they also wrote the JavaScript lp 2 p from scratch, if I'm not mistaken. Why? Because uh, there was no JavaScript uh, IPFS, I think, oh, I at see. the time. It was the part of JavaScript IPFS project. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm not like 100 certain of that, okay. but that's what I think happened. Uh, yep. So what is this lp 2 p It's like just the communication between some random set of peers? Uh, yeah, it's basically a framework to do decentralized, like decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks. Whatever you want the network to do is up to you. But the networking part, the low-level part, is handled by lp 2 p I see. Like today, I heard lots of people are using lp 2 p for blockchain. Yeah. Uh, but it's not meant just for the blockchain. So we're probably just going to talk a bit about yeah. non-blockchain specific stuff. Yeah, IPFS uses it as yeah. mentioned. So and then like jump to the blockchain specific stuff with adver adversaries and selfish behavior, like at the very end. Mm. Uh, cool. So, um, can you say how exactly the relaying works in the loop PTP? Um, so, what do you mean by relaying? Do you mean just communication between nodes? Yeah, because like to my understanding, the point of loop P2P is that if you have a group of nodes, they don't communicate like everyone to everyone, right? Uh, well, that's kind of agnostic on top of loop P2P. Loop P2P doesn't really care about that. Loop P2P uh, lets you establish communications between nodes. Which nodes you actually establish a communication with is up to you. So that's on top of loop P2P. But you can ask some node to relay information to another node, right? Uh, Yes and no. <laughs> um, like at the core level, mm -hmm. the answer is no. Yeah, like really? At the very lowest core. Uh, on top of that, we have several protocols. Oh, I see. Yeah. One of which, no, two of which are float sub, gossip sub, which are pub sub mechanism, and they handle connecting to nodes and relaying messages, blah, blah, blah. I see. Uh, there's also another concept, depending on what exactly you're talking about, uh, the relay protocol. But it's not about relaying messages. It, well, it's not about gossiping. It's about, about gossiping. yeah, proxying, acting as a proxy or as a VPN, whatever you want to, to, to for a different node. Yep. I see. So you, you if node Alice and Bob want to talk to each other, mm -hmm. Alice can ask to. Uh, What's the name of C? Uh, Claire. Claire, okay. <laughs> Alice can ask Claire uh, to establish a communication with Bob. And so Alice and Bob, we communicate through Claire. I see. I see. And uh, okay. And this is a different from gossip because gossip yeah. happens like uncontrollably sort of. Yep. It's like a, like a propagation of information in a yep. controllable way. Yep. That's what gossip is. Uh, they are kind of connected but we can we will go back to it later i suppose okay because you need relaying for not traversal and so on mm, yeah we're gonna talk about it yep. later so the go version of lip p is full of features right you go to their website and it's just like a list of yep. all kind of features that they support in there so which of those features you know get translated into the rust version that you actually working oh. on 
so the, the website is not up to date at all, unfortunately. Which one? The, uh, the Lit goal? Lit oh. No, no, uh, yeah, for Rust, it's not up to oh, date. Oh, I see. Uh, like if you go on the website, it says not implemented, not implemented, not implemented. I see. But actually, almost everything is implemented. Um, we have a few things that are not implemented. We don't have Quick. We don't have TLS because um, uh, well, we use TLS, but we don't have the protocol named TLS according to the P2P. Okay. Um, what do we not? Have? We don't have WebRTC. Oh yeah. We don't have gossip sub, but uh, there's a pull request open made by someone else, not from Parity, not from my company. Um, but it's not merged in master. Um, I see. But basically, it, the rest is uh, is the same as Go. You have hole punching there, right? Uh, no, we don't have hole punching. Damn it! But you're gonna have hole punching. Uh, eventually, yes. Pull request. Can, can, can you can you talk more about like what hole hole punching is because um, popular feature. Uh, maybe I can use the whiteboard because this, this element hasn't been used. It's available. So if you have Alice and you have Bob, yeah. <laughs> how do I draw a B again? And want to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, here you have a gnat and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, why is it a problem? So imagine that's like your home. Yes, and your laptop. That's your home, yes. And that's your router, your uh, your box. Your yeah. in Germany, that would be a Fritz box, for example, because that's what everyone has. That's your router or your NAT. Uh, and typically, in your home, you have multiple multiple uh, machines yes. connected to the same NAT by Wi-Fi or by cable. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Um, and so, if B tries to connect. It will reach here, but then the router doesn't know who to connect to because everything here has the same IP address. The IP address is here. And so the router doesn't know, hey, which one, which one do you actually want to talk to? Unless the connection is already established. Yep. That's why in order to do NAT traversal, so the easiest way to solve to solve NAT traversal is if A establishes the connection. If A wants to talk to B, it's not a problem. Unless B is also behind the NAT, but in this example, it's not. So what is the relation between those two things, NAT traversal and hole punching? Um, is it the same well, concept? So hole punching is the other way to solve NAT traversal. Mm -hmm. um, you have two kinds of hole punching, TCP and UDP. Uh, UDP hole punching is basically uh, A and B send UDP packets to each other. And that kind of confuses the router. Mm -hmm. um, well, you need like a relaying, uh, some way to synchronize. Like step one is A and B know that they want to talk to each okay. other. Like you, it cannot start out of nowhere. You, okay. Step one is A and B need to know that they want to talk to each other. Okay. And then they start ex sending UDP packets to each other. Like on timer or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like the packets from B are not going to reach A. Mm -hmm. But since A is sending packets as well, the router is going to believe that A is, to, is establishing a connection. And so the packets from B are actually going to go through. Like this, this is just a hack to tell the router, hey, I want incoming. So you're basically open. exploiting some misfeature in router? Uh, well, for UDP, it's not a misfeature. Uh, for UDP, it's kind of the way it's supposed to work. Oh, I see. Um, like it's the, it's the way to tell the router that you want to establish connection. Yeah. Right. Uh, the cool thing, so you're going to say, why not just have B, uh, why not just have A establish a connection? UDP or punching works if both A and B are be behind the router. Mm -hmm. so, you imagine you have yeah. a router here as well. UDP yeah. hole punching is still going to work. Yeah. Like A's packets are going to say A's router that it wants B's packets to come so, and vice versa. So if router implement this protocol to establish the connection already, why won't they have something more simple like I send UDP with certain payload that tells me tells the router that it, you know we're trying to establish connection with B. Well, that would be a, sec a big security issue. Anyone can could send a packet.
Oh. Like there needs to be something from A. Oh, and from B, like yeah. this like handshake thing. If A doesn't know that B wants to establish a connection, mm -hmm. there's no way for B to do that because that, yeah. yeah, that would be a pretty big security I issue. See. Well, it's more like the router is designed to prevent that to happen specifically. So why, 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 won't, why won't router specify that when A and B want to establish connection, they send one single package towards each other just once with certain um, kind of payload? So uh, there is kind of this mechanism-ish, no, no, not that exactly, mm -hmm. but you have UPnP, PCP, and another one which I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically protocols that let us tell the router, hey, I want I to see. open a port. Um, the problem with that is that UPnP is extremely crappy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the details, I've never investigated really much into U UPnP, but from what everyone says, it's kind of crappy, not working well, full of issues, and so on and so forth. Also, UPnP doesn't work if you have two routers, oh. if you are behind two routers. Uh, PCP is well better designed. PCP is the modern version of UPnP, but it's not implemented everywhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's kind of this trade-off. That's why hole punching is still a thing because of UPnP scrap, PCP is not implemented everywhere. I see, got it. So this is UDP hole punching. Yep. How does TCP hole punching work? So TCP hole punching was kind of the same way. It's just the implementation details that are a bit uh, uh, more weird. Uh, so again, I, I don't know the, de the very, very specific details. I don't know, but to establish a TCP connection, you have a free, free messages handshake, sin, ACK, and sin, ACK, um, no, sin, sin, ACK, and ACK. Mm -hmm. And you basically flood each other sin, ACK packets. Okay. Instead of sending UDP packets, yeah. same principle, but you oh, see, see. Send just CD. a different type of packets. Yeah. Uh, you said, mm -hmm. so that the router, again, the point is to tell the router, yeah. hey, I want, to, I want this connection to happen. Um, same principle, there needs to be a synchronizing point. Mm -hmm. I think you need to agree on one port to use. Mm -hmm. So the synchronization point, like step zero is yes. A and B need to be able to, A and B need to know that they want to talk to each other. On the specific port. Yeah. That, because that's what I heard, like one of the ways to do the hole punching is that A first opens connection with someone else on some given port and then gives this port number to B and then B can talk on that port, right? Uh, yeah, that's like that. kind of the thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I don't know the very specific details of TCP hole punching because I never actually implemented it. But yeah, that's like you could pretend that B is the IP of the, mm -hmm. of the third party that's used for synchronization. Okay. So I heard that libptp has, well, I didn't hear it. I know that it has the special format of the ad address, right? Yeah, which multi is address. Like, yeah, multi-address, more universal than just like IP address. Can you explain what multi-address is? Uh, so the, be the best way to explain that is just to give examples. So instead of having just an IP address, um, you have it in this format. So instead of saying uh, 123.48.0.213, yeah. ports 1030, yeah. you just write this and it's the same. Uh, that's basically just some user-friendly way. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't bring any technological advantage. It doesn't bring anything new on the technical level. It's mm -hmm. just a way to make this more user-friendly. Um, you can like combine protocols in multi addresses. Uh, you can actually create like stacks on top of that. Mm -hmm. So if you want, um, you can add WS at the end. Yes. WS means WebSocket. Mm -hmm. And basically, this now means WebSockets on top of 
these TCP connections. Okay. And uh, you're going to exchange messages within WebSocket frames instead of raw messages on the TCP, on the TCP connection. Okay. There's also like quick, there's also uh, Unix, you can put a Unix path uh, and so on and so forth. You have relaying capacities, so you can write P2P-circuit. So you said that relaying is something that is a higher level than libp2p, right? Uh, yeah, it's not part of a very core, it's a, like a protocol on top. It's still part of the libp2p framework, more or less, but it's, uh, it's an optional component. That's oh, it's an optional component, okay. Yeah. I see. But anyone can have their own relaying on it. Uh, again, define relaying. Do you mean gossiping? Or do yeah, you mean gossiping. It? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah, but that's one of the major selling points of lip 2 p You can, every protocol is optional. You can write your own protocol. You don't have to use anything. Uh, okay. Like the, there's a few components that are part of a core. The multi addresses thing, for example. Okay. Uh, peer identities, the public private keys. Is also the, the part of the core? Yeah, the public key has a specific format. Okay. And then you hash it in a specific way, it gives you a, a Peer, an identity of a node oh. that's part of a core as well. And negotiating a protocol is part of a core. So maybe I could elaborate yeah. on that. Yeah. So when you establish a connection, so imagine you establish a, co a quick connection. Uh, I'm going to give uh, like a concrete example. So imagine you're using the P2P. Uh, imagine you're using UDP and I ask the P2P. Uh, you're using the, you're using the P2P, and I ask the P2P to connect to this address. Okay. It's going to use Quic, okay. the Quic protocol. Quic has uh, encryption and multiplexing already in the protocol. So once the connection is open, we negotiate quick and connection is open. But if I ask, um, uh, oops, if I ask this instead, that's a regular TCP IP connection. Okay. It's just a stream of bytes. There's no encryption. There's no multiplexing. So when this situation happens, there's like step two and step three, which is negotiate encryption, negotiate multiplexing. And so when we open the connection, we use a protocol named multi-stream select. Mm -hmm. And the two parts of the connection talk to each other and say, hey, do you want to use uh, Sekayo? Do you want to use TLS? Do you want to use noise, which are encryption protocols? And they agree on a specific encryption protocol to use. Then they do the Diffie Hellman and so on and so forth. And then step three is do the same for encrypt for multiplexing, sorry. I see. With Yamux, for example. So that's not needed with Quick, because Quick already has this yeah, baked in. Yeah. But if you have a raw connection, you need to negotiate encryption and multiplex and multiplexing. Okay. Can you talk talk more about uh, this uh, private public key that you need uh, for the for the LPTP and what is it used for? Uh, that's basically how you identify a node. That's how you differentiate two nodes. Um, two nodes or sessions? Nodes. No. So if if uh, if I leave if I if my if my machine got disconnected from the network and rejoins, it uses the same public private yeah. key. Um, Basically, P two P, there's no concept necessarily of disconnecting, reconnecting uh -huh. from the network. I mean, you can disconnect from a node and reconnect to the same node later, but there's no I disconnected from the entire network. Uh, you, I don't know if you see what I mean. Is there a difference? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's no difference between a, a node connecting to zero peers and an offline node. Um, okay. So yeah, every single node on the network has a private key and a public key. Mm -hmm. And the private key is used in the encryption negotiation. Well, the private and the public key, obviously. 
So uh, when you establish a connection to someone, you prove that they are the identity that they claim to be. So every node can actually, is supposed to use the same public and private key with every other node that they establish connection yep. to. But there is no way to enforce it, right? Uh, well, if I use several different public key, if I use several different keys, they are considered as several, as several different nodes. I see. I see. Um, again, there's no real way to like it's detect not, that. You could not, just run the same program twice on your machine. So got it. Just, it's not like they override each other or anything like that. They right? what? It's not like they override each other. Like one takes priority over another. No, no, no. no. I see. Uh, what the situation where they would override each other is you have two clients using the same peer ID. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you have two machines using the same yes. keys, uh, like that will create bugs more or less because like a node will think it's already connected to you. Yeah. So it receives an extra connection. It's like, oh, I can close one since yes. one is useless. Like you only need yeah. one, so it's going to close one connection. So. Like you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But there is no like tie breaking happening there that allows to you to just like prevent the cyclic, you know, like reconnecting to different nodes every time they talk to you. No. No. Well, again, there's no different. There's no way to detect that. There's no way to differentiate that from a normal from okay. a normal, be, a normal behavior. Sorry. Okay. And talking about tie breaking, like if two nodes try to establish connections simultaneously to each other, how do they negotiate? which one is actually incoming and which one is outgoing? Um, so in JavaScript and Go and in Rust in the future, uh, we are just simply allowing multiple connections mm -hmm. uh, and all, co all the communications like go on one or the other. Like did they choose random one or like how does that? Uh, I don't know for JavaScript and Go. I don't know this detail. I see. Um, at the moment in Rust, we don't do that. In Rust, we do a tiebreaker, as you said. And what uh, is tiebreaker based on? Uh, the peer ID. Oh, that's it. Like, Got it. The, the lowest identity wins for the dialing side. Oh, I see. Uh, it's actually quite hard to implement correctly. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you tried that in here. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. That was hard. Yes. <laughs> we did so many mistakes with it. Yeah. But it then took also, us two months or maybe even more. But then also the interesting thing is that if you have some node who just turns like accidentally has the lowest public key or whatever ID then everyone is going to have inbound connection with it, right? It's not like it's going to have a balanced mix of inbound and outbound connection. No, it's it, only decided if they died each other simultaneously. Yeah, okay. Uh, Makes sense. Like if you receive, if you, yeah, if you receive a connection, yeah. you're not going to die the same node yourself. You're yes. just yes. going to use your incoming connection. Yeah. So even if your identity is uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 yeah. You're going to receive incoming connections, but you're not going to establish yeah. others. It's rare. Yes. So the, the tiebreaker doesn't is not relevant. Which is leads to another question: How does peer discovery work in LPTP? Uh, so again, it's not part of a very core. That's okay. protocols on top. Uh, you have like three mechanisms. One is basically boots nodes, because. Um, like all over the internet, you need some way to bootstrap yourself to join an existing, an existing network. And so boot nodes are hard coded identities and addresses. Um, addresses like that, obviously. Yeah. Uh, not IP address port, but that, which is more or less the same. Um, second mechanism is MDNS, which is discovering nodes on the local the local network, the LAN, the local area network. And how does it work? Uh, with UDP broadcasting. Mm -hmm. So at a regular interval, I don't remember. It's exactly. just like a heartbeat that you're broadcasting yeah, over basically. the network, I see. Uh, we just send a message saying, hey, are there people out there? Mm -hmm. uh, MDNS is a standard protocol. It's not a lip P2P specific thing. Okay. But lip P2P has a small extension to MDNS to be able to, to say, uh, hey, my identity is like we need to pass the identity of a node as part of the uh, of process. Okay. So, yeah. And that's two mechanisms. Uh, yep. And you can combine them together. Also, yeah, yeah right? you can have both. In Substrate, we have both. Yeah. Uh, the third one would be Cademia. So uh, 
To go into like a real world situation, MDNS is useless. Maybe. Well, not useless, but like, you have a blockchain, you want to connect to the internet. Uh, it very rarely happens that you have another node in your, in your local network. Yes. So we can like ignore MDNS. Boot nodes only like four nodes. It's just for the initial connection, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, in Substrate right now, it's four nodes. You can like boot nodes cannot be the the store of all addresses of the entire yep, blockchain. Exactly. It's too much for them, right? Yep. Uh, and therefore, Cademia is like the main mechanism to discover the network. Okay. Uh, that's why I exp I yes. did this small uh, off-topic thing. Uh, I guess I should explain Cademia. Uh, please. <laughs> well, that's extremely hard to explain uh, in a very. Uh, if you don't know anything about Cademia, that's kind of hard to explain. Well, that's a good thing that you're explaining to whoever is viewing this video, because otherwise <laughs> it would be really hard for them to understand, right? So, yeah. Imagine that's the, that's the linear space. I'm going to say it to you so oh, Nice, math. we're going in math. So, imagine that's the node A, 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 A. Uh -huh. It's the ID. Uh, oh, I should not have said AA would be zero zero zero. Okay. Well, that's so the public key. The hash of the public key. Hash of the public yeah, key. Yeah, your, your identity. And that would be F. Uh, no, we are using they, We are not using. <laughs> I'm stupid. We are not using hexadecimals. We are. We are using something else. We are using base sixty-eight. Uh, fifty-eight. So that would be Z Z Z Z Z. And why do you need to hash public key and not just use it as it is? Uh, good question. That's totally off topic to Kalimia. <laughs> but, I see. Um, in EP2P, the format of a public key is generic. Mm -hmm. So we don't say uh, you need ED25519. We just are generic over format. It can be RSA, it can be ED25519, it can be SECP, okay, okay. it okay. can be anything else in the future. Um, RSA keys need to be hashed because they are Got too it. large otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's like some discussions. If it's ED25519, just pass the key itself. Yeah. Yeah. But that uh, has some consequences. Uh, yep. Let's just assume it's hashed. Cool. Why, why isn't base58 and not just hex? There's no specific reason. Like Got it. Base58 is just shorter. That's shorter, it. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay, so I was explaining Cademia. Yep. So that's the space of identities. Every single node is somewhere here. Is somewhere on this line. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm going to use an, another color. What's the time, by the way? Am I late or? No, you're fine. Okay. This doesn't work very well, but... Oh, here another one. Here we go. It's not going to be visible. Oh. Well... So you're partitioning this linear space? No, no, that's not partitioning, that's just nodes. Okay, that's not I nodes. I should have put some arrows maybe instead. Mm -hmm. So these would be arrows, I suppose. Let's pretend they are arrows. And imagine your node is here. My node is here. Yeah. Um, do you have another color? Yes. Thank you. And your node is going to store 200, uh, no, not 256, 20 node nodes which are in this space, 20 other nodes which are in this space. Sampled? Uh, what do you mean sampled? Like the space is dense, right? So if I have 20 nodes in this space, yeah. then the 20 nodes of this space, I mean, they... Oh, yeah. Um, so for example, this space excludes this. Oh, got it, yeah, got it, excludes. It's only, it's only I see. the parts mm -hmm. on the outside. Uh, 20 nodes here. Well, obviously here yeah. uh, there's nothing. 
but you get the point. Yeah. Um, and of course, smaller and smaller and smaller. If your, uh, if your node identity is 256 bits long, uh, which is the case usually, yes. then you're going to have 256 of these Breakers. intervals. Okay. So um, what that means is each interval contains 20 nodes whose distance is a specific, like, is in a specific interval. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, this, this is what we call a bucket, by the way, mm -hmm. stores 20 nodes in, in here, which means the distance between this and this. But like, what, what do you mean by like 20 nodes? Do I choose arbitrary 20 nodes from uh, inside this bracket? Uh, in practice, it's arbitrary. Yeah, I, uh, the way it's implemented is just first come, first serve. Ah, I like, see. Uh, when you connect to someone or when someone connects to you, you add them to the list. I see, yeah. I see. Um, yep. And so that's the way Kalimia works. So each node is responsible for knowing the nodes that are next to, mm -hmm. next to them. Yes. So uh, imagine I want to know about this node. Yes. So I'm here. I want to know about. I want to know about this guy. I'm going to look in this bucket. Mm -hmm. Which one I know of is like the closest, yes. and it's this guy. And you're going to ask him. So I, I'm going to ask him. Hey, give me information about this guy. Well. That's not, that's not a good example because we already know this guy in this example. Yeah. Imagine I want to know about a node that is here when, there, when there's, no, where there's no arrow. I'm going to ask this guy, give me information about this. And why would, like, why would you want to do this? I mean, if you already have those brackets. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's us all. It's only when you're constructing those brackets, like you're trying to fill them with 20 nodes each, right? Yeah, yeah. you're actively trying to fill yeah. Those bra these brackets. And when you lose the connection with one of the nodes, you remove them from this bracket and then you try to uh, fill it again. If we lose a connection, we, uh, we don't remove a node from a bracket, we put it on the bottom of a, of a list. Oh, okay. And if we connect to someone else in the same I bracket, see. it gets replaced. So, so each bracket is like a priority, uh, yep. priority yeah, list. Yeah. Got it. It's only if, uh, if a bucket is full. Mm -hmm. uh, it's named buckets. I, I just okay, I fine, always yes. say into yeah. no bracket. It's named a bucket. Okay. If the bucket is full, we start replacing okay. disconnected nodes with okay. new nodes. And uh, this works because it has some good mathematical properties or something. Uh, so the reason why um, Kadima exists is that so this is called a DHT for, for the audience. DHT means distributed hash table. Uh, so imagine that would be a table. The elements of the table are, are hashes yeah. and it's distributed because each node knows about the hashes next to their identity. Yeah. Um, the point of Kademia normally is to store arbitrary values. So each node is not only responsible for knowing the nodes that are next to it yes. in identities, but also for storing values which, whose hash are next to it. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, if you want to store a hash, uh, if you want to store a value in this table, you're going to find the nodes that are close to the hash of that value and you tell them, hey, please store this. Yeah. That's the reason why Kademia exists. And we are using this as a discovery mechanism as kind of a, a um, how to say that, a, a derivation. Yes. Way, but it's not the primary reason why Kalimia exists. Yeah, special case of it. Yep. Got it. Uh, Ethereum uses Kalimia for its discovery. Uh, IPFS uses Kalimia for its discovery. IPFS also uses the regular properties of Kalimia. And in Substrate, we're also using the regular properties of Kalimia um, to store some validator information. But that's. I yeah. see. Yeah. So you can just also piggyback some metadata on this yeah, yeah. top of these IDs. That's why we're using Kademia, because uh, in Substrate, we've, we've also investigated other over discovery mechanisms. Uh -huh. and, but we need to be able to find info, to store more information with DHT, so we switched back to Kademia. Got it. Uh, OK, so you said many times that. I'm grabbing my water. Yeah. That libptp is modular, right? Yeah. Um, which means I can actually 
define uh, certain implementations so this behavior of the slip ptp library that i want to be customized for my own use yep. and there is even uh, this uh, behavior trait or something yep. in the lip ptp that you can implement can uh, that's specific to rust slip ptp okay can you talk more about it uh, Maybe I can also talk about the way Rust DPTP yeah. works. In general, how would you use yeah. Rust DPTP? Uh, how you would use Rust DPTP is a bit too uh, like complicated to explain. Like you need a tutorial and everything. Okay. Um, but the way Rust DPTP works, like as a in memory, basically, you have one thread, one green thread, one coroutine, whatever you want to call that, for each connection. So you have connection one, connection two, oops, a three, four, and these these are each like separate coroutines. Okay. These are each separate threads. Um, in Rust TP2P, you have like a handler, what we call a handler object. Uh, that, so that would be the internet, basically. And you have one handler for each connection in its own thread. And then you have a main uh, thread or task or coroutine or again whatever you want to call that, that acts as a synchronization point. What does it synchronize between those connections? So um, what is exchanged here between the handlers and the main thread are uh, messages that contain logic. So that would be, for example, a ping to give the most simple example. Hey, send. Oh, no, ping is not actually exchanged here. So let's ignore that. Um, could be start academia request. Uh, start, I'm going to write that down. I see. So main thread, yeah, decides that it's time to start academia request. Yeah. The main thread, for example, tells I want to start academia request on connection two. Yes. Of course, he knows the identity of the node yes. of the connection. And then later, so the handler receives a message. Hey, I need to start academia request. Translates that into bytes. And then this, it sends out the bytes on the connection. Mm -hmm. And then later the connection replies with bytes. Yes. The handler translates that into a Kademia answer and then okay. sends back the, the response. So this behavior trait, it implements what you, you say you run in these connections and main thread. Uh, the network behavior traits, trait implements basically every, everything. Kind of like, to implement the trait, you only need to implement that part. Mm -hmm. And that's named protocols handler in the code. Like the handler thingy is named protocols handler. Okay. Uh, fun fact, so that's the API you're supposed to use okay. uh, if you want to use Rust DPP. Uh, on the lower level, there's another API where this is named node handler. And uh, thanks to this low-level API, you can turn an EP 2 p into anything you want, basically. You can turn that into an HTTP, hand, uh, an HTTP, ser HTTP server, for I example. I see, yeah. Interesting. Uh, That's cool. That's only if you use the low-level connection, the low-level API. Okay. And same principle, like, uh, connection one sends an HTTP request to the handler. The handler says to a main thread, hey, I have an HTTP request. The main thread sends back the response okay. and it's turned into bytes. Cool. But that's like kind of off topic, but because, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's now talk maybe a little bit about the blockchain part of libptp, right? Mm -hmm. So since it's becomes so popular oh, yeah, in just blockchain world. Yeah, just to finish on that yeah. quickly. This also sends out pings. Uh, this sends out uh, uh, ask debug information, that kind of stuff. So the handler and the connection are also kind of isolated. Oh, I see. Like acting on their own. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The main thread doesn't they have to do everything. That's why they are kind of segregated. Cool. So regarding the blockchain world, right? Mm. Uh, it has this adversarial scenarios. It has people, you know, not just with selfish behavior where yeah. they uh, don't want to follow the protocol. Um, so 
Uh, I know that you have this reputation system implemented. Yeah, it's, Is a, it substrate, the, yeah. it's a substrate, it's not a part of Lit PTP. Uh, no, it's only a substrate, yeah. I see. So what can you, what can you tell in general about this reputation system? Um, so uh, according to, to you, like mm -hmm. every node has a, has a hash map basically of every other node that it knows of and has a reputation value associated to it. Uh, I explain that this way because when you talk about reputation, people think uh, the reputation is a network reputation. Like, no, that's not the case. Your reputation is different For each towards other every nodes. single person. I see. Yeah. It's not a global reputation. It's completely different or it's just like loosely correlated? Uh, is it just like slightly different or is it like completely off? For everyone. Oh, you mean, well, you're only going to have a reputation with the nodes you've ever been connected yes. with. So if you have 10,000 nodes, yeah. uh, in practice, Substrate, you open maximum 50 connections. I see. So you're going to have a reputation with 50 nodes and not the, the 9,950 others, basically. Okay. Um, so to go back to the reputation itself, whenever you do something beneficial, your reputation increases whenever you do something uh, not malicious but not beneficial, like um, uh, not useful, your reputation decreases. The idea behind that is um, imagine you're a node, you receive a message, you're going to need some CPU and memory, CPU yeah. time to process yes. the message. So every single message that you receive should decrease the reputation of a sender. But if it turns out the message is useful, then the reputation is increased by more than what it got decreased. I see. But if you receive a useless message, you're not going to gain any reputation yeah. and you have this default decrease because you need CPU yes. time to process I the see. message. And if you misbehave entirely, it just goes to zero or something like that. Uh, yep. In practice, to minus um, to minimum value of a thirty-two sign integer, but yeah, same principles, same principle as zero. I see. And why not just ban someone who sends you something that they're not supposed to send? Um, so that's what we did. So if you send something completely off, if you send random garbage bytes, we're going to ban you. But uh, in practice, in grandpa, well, these are the Grandpa is the finality uh, algorithm we use yes. in Substrate. Uh, in Grandpa, you have messages where we don't know if it's actually useful or not, or we, go, we don't know if it's useful yet, we're going to know later. Or maybe you receive messages from two rounds ago or three rounds ago, and the message would have been useful if they had been received now, uh, uh, if they had been received earlier, but now they are no longer useful. And um, because of that, we have this reputation system. It's the higher level code that decides of the reputation change and not just the low level networking. I see. So basically, uh, even the f like completely honest nodes that follow the protocol exactly mm -hmm. will sometimes produce useless messages. And yes. so they just, they're useful and in expectations or, or something like that, or like amortized, whatever. Yep. I yeah. see. Got it. It's not just malicious versus non-malicious. It's, it's also uh, like, well, actually kind of yes, uh, but not strictly that. Like you can be non-malicious and still get reputation. And what, what, does, what happens to you when your reputation goes into garbage? Like you're um, not getting banned, you just... No, no, no. Uh, eventually, um, so we want to rotate nodes. I see. And the nodes with uh, less reputation get kicked off. Like oh, I see. The, the, we disconnect from them. I see. Uh, it's also used when later we want to connect to someone else. Like we have a free slot, we have a, a slot to connect to. We're going to choose the node with the highest reputation. Uh, every node is trying to maximize the, the nodes. The popularity in the network. Yep. I see. We have to find the right balance for that. Um, because, for example, someone in the middle of Siberia yes. has a lot of latency and we don't want their reputation to go to zero and that's, they end that's up not being fault, right? to no one. Yeah. But, then, then, that, but then everyone else can pretend to be in Siberia, right? Uh, uh, 
or like just malicious or whatever. No, like actors. The, the point is, uh, someone in in Siberia has no choice but to have latency, and yeah. we don't want them to be isolated because entirely. Of that. Yeah. I see. They're going to be kind of deprioritized, but not isolated entirely. Uh, that's the goal. Yes. Got it. Got it. In practice, we're not totally sure. Like, like we haven't analyzed uh, yeah, the dynamics uh, and everything. Sorry. Did you haven't analyzed the dynamics? No, no, we haven't really, like, uh, it, it's a very pragmatic approach for the moment. Uh, okay. The reputation values are kind of arbitrary, like, uh, this kind of message increases your, your reputation by 400, for example. Why 400? Yeah, yeah, because the guy who wrote the code was So that's like, a good idea. Yeah, 400 looks nice. <laughs> that's basically what we're doing right now. Okay. But we, we want to tweak the values in the future, basically. Okay, cool. I think we're sort of out of time mm -hmm. right now. Uh, so I suggest we wrap it up and just like thank everyone for whoever was watching this. <laughs> and this is it, right? Okay. Thanks. Thanks.